we, uh, as you guys know, if you've watched any of the videos in this channel, the COVID crisis started earlier this year. And we, uh, Dr. Malone and I, when we were uh, shut down, uh, the firm had done a pretty consistent uh, video series on COVID and the virus and what to, what to expect and where things were going and the daily uh, infection rate and the hospital beds and the ICU beds available and all that stuff. And fortunately for us, uh, our peak came and went without any stress or that wasn't a significant stress on our hospital, local hospital system. That has changed. As of last week, I think I've noticed it Thursday, there were three or four beds one day last week, ICU beds available in the county. It went up to seven or eight, I think at the beginning of this week. Um, I asked Dr. Malone to monitor that because there wasn't a lot about that in the mainstream press uh, that I saw. Maybe there was and I just didn't see it. But obviously, it's a consideration for people to know, especially, especially if you're in a high risk factor, if your county only has one or two or three hospital ICU beds available. So, Dr. Malone, what is the current status of the ICU bed availability in Escambia County? Um, so as of this morning, we have seven beds in the county that are available. And I've, we're going to share this link with everybody. Um, it's a, the uh, state coordinates this. It's a reporting system. And you can drill into it and look at by county here. So as of this morning, um, Skimby County actually had six when I did the print off. But since then, it's gone up to seven. It's pretty real time. So of our 141 ICU beds in the county, there's six available. So 4%. Uh, that's not encouraging, right? Uh, that seems like a low number. Am I wrong to say that? But uh, you're not wrong. And yeah, it is low. And, you know, when you look across all the counties, this is a, this, this whole printout that I have that I'm sharing here is all the counties in the state. And, you know, we're one of the lowest as far as percentage available um, uh, with the adult ICU beds. Pediatric ICU beds is a little bit of a different story. You know, there's 16 that are available in the county and there's 12 that are, uh, or there's 16 total and there's 12 that are available at the time. Um, when you look down at Santa Rosa County, um, that's actually a little bit of a different story. Santa Rosa County, um, and you're, there you're talking about J Hospital, Gulf Breeze Hospital, Santa Rosa Medical Center. There's of their of their 23 uh, beds, they have nine available, so they're at 40 percent availability. And uh, one note that I'll bring up is, and I'm sure parents know this already, but there are no pediatric ICU beds at all in Santa Rosa County. So right. you're relying upon a two county area if there's pediatric need for ICU beds. So when we say, hey, there's 16 ICU beds for pediatrics, it counts basically Escambia and Santa Rosa County. Um, so you can't get too granular on that. Um, okay. um, so anyhow, so we are low. <laughs> and are there numbers for the number of respirators in the county uh, aside from the number of ICU beds? Or, or are those synonymous? Um, they're not synonymous. And the county has been uh, publishing this data every day. And I've been looking at it. They put it out at three o'clock every day. I can get that link up uh, um, at the end. But as of yesterday at 3 p.m., there were uh, let's see here, two, uh, there's 215 total ventil ventilators that could be used and 140 were available. Okay, well, that's So there, there's more ventilators than there are beds. All I right, see well, that's good. So so uh, the scary part of this, I guess, was the ICU beds. Those are, that means to be monitored in the traditional ICU fashion, there's only yeah. so many beds available. So even if you went in, heaven forbid, with a, a serious accident or something that required you to be in ICU, there's only four beds available for that, for traditional stuff. And then obviously, if you needed a respirator for COVID purposes, I guess they've got enough machines laying around where they could set up potentially a, a, a unit or a room that could yep. support uh, a respirator. Yeah. And, you know, in, in a hospital without being specific about any facility, you start thinking of the trauma base and ERs, the pre-op and post-op recovery units that could be used to, I guess, temporarily house someone or run a ventilator. And then some of these step down units that aren't really ICU beds, but could also perhaps take a ventilator if needed. So, and then you're going to post, or we're going to post underneath this video, these, these bar graphs for the week. Obviously we're going up yeah. here. You can't tell it from yeah. that far this is, but uh, from, the, from the documents we'll post, you'll be able to see all that information. 
Yeah, I can I can share that quick. This is this is the trend that Joe and I were discussing today, uh, yesterday, and you know we've had two pretty stout publications the last two days. Um, the top of this sheet shows that the nine twenty five a.m. harvest every day, and they haven't really been pushing until about one or two in the afternoon um, as far as public availability. But to see these numbers like this, it's scary. And then along with that, the, the percent positivity, as Joe has talked about many times here, were 17% two days ago and 9.2% yesterday. I mean, our, right. our positivity has been much higher than what we'd be comfortable with even back in June when we were having an outbreak. And the moral of the story is, yeah, the vaccine is there. And hopefully it'll be uh, start being used this weekend, if not today. But that doesn't, it's not going to help the uh, most of us until later. So um, even after the first dose, they're not, you know, I think it's a 70%, um, uh, what do you call it, effective rate. But um, you won't get that in your arm if you're just in the general population for months. Mm -hmm. So the idea that it's on the horizon, it ain't going to help you if you catch the virus tomorrow. Catch the virus tomorrow and you get the vaccine the next day. Guess what? That doesn't help you. Yep. <laughs> so. Uh, you have to get the vaccine before you're infected. In fact, uh, I think the studies were that even if you got the virus the same day you got the vaccine, it doesn't take effect right away. It takes effect days later. So yes. the idea that you, the vaccine is there should not give you any sense of security at all until the shot's in your arm and you've got, got a couple of days away, from, a week away from it, then you're, you really don't have any uh, greater protection than you have now. So. Uh, it's really important that you uh, stay vigilant in your masking and distancing. Um, I, I'm speaking from personal experience. I had the virus in September. It didn't get rid of it until about two weeks ago. We're now in December, obviously. So uh, it's, a, it's a real deal. Uh, I didn't have any of the comorbidity type stuff or the uh, risk factors necessarily. And um, it really took a toll on my lungs and, um, and put me down basically for about I don't know, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. So uh, be careful, stay masked. We'll keep, we'll keep an eye, look out on these uh, things that maybe don't get picked up by the general uh, media here and there. And uh, we thank Dr. Malone for helping us do this. Thank you, doctor. Y'all yep. take care.